All right, welcome everybody to an exciting webinar on Unrigging Our Democracy. Thank you so much for joining us. We are very excited to see folks joining from all across the country today. Um, we're in a fascinating moment with the pandemic right now that's exposed these longstanding disparities in voting. We not only see racial disparities in accessing healthcare services, but also widespread disparities in access to the ballot. And yet, many of these disparities are a direct result of intentional and longstanding policy decisions. We're fortunate today to have an expert who has traveled the entire country speaking to citizens who have fought back and won against attempts to subvert our democracy. I'd like to take a moment now to introduce our esteemed speaker for today, David Daly. David is the author of Rat Eft, the true story behind the secret plan to steal America's democracy. Not sure I can say the word live on a webinar here, but this helped spark the recent drive to reform gerrymandering. Dave's second book, which is what we're here to talk about today, Unrigged, How Americans Are Battling Back to Save Democracy, chronicles the victories and defeats in state efforts to reform elections and uphold voting rights. His work has appeared in The New Yorker, The Atlantic, The Guardian, and many other publications. He's also a senior fellow at Fair Vote and the former editor-in-chief of Salon. Welcome, David. Thanks for having me. I'm also glad to be joined today by, um, I was going to be joined by our legislative director, Colin Cole, who is an avid fan himself of David's work and a passionate supporter of democracy reform in Washington state and nationwide. But unfortunately he is unavailable tonight. Instead, I'm pleased to welcome our executive director, Lisa Arrow, who will be joining me to moderate tonight's conversation. Lisa first learned about ranked choice voting more than 30 years ago when she taught a lesson to her middle school students about the mathematics of voting. Lisa holds a BA in philosophy from Stanford. She and her husband spent two years as Peace Corps volunteers in Niger, Africa, living under a military dictatorship impressed upon her the imperative to be an active steward of our democracy. Lisa, why don't you start by telling us a little bit about what got you excited about electoral reform and a little bit more about tonight's session. Great, thanks Mohit. Uh, it's good to be here. And I will say for me, I think I'm somebody who likes to look at the root, uh, at the root of what is driving uh, something that uh, needs fixing. And to me, electoral reform seemed to be the obvious place to go when I began to be concerned about uh, our, the direction our democracy was headed. Uh, so I'm a big fan of David's. Uh, I, I actually, con true confession, I actually, uh, every night before I go to bed, I do a quick search for ranked choice voting news things. And I always check first to see if there's something by David. I don't understand how you can be so prolific and so compelling. And so how, how each time I read something by you, David, uh, you seem to find fresh language for the, uh, for the same topics. And I find it very invigorating uh, to be able to read your stuff. So really looking forward to this conversation. Um, Mohit, I realized in our preparation, we failed to introduce you. So I've got a little bio of you. I wanna just say how, what a pleasure it's been to have Mohit join our team, uh, relatively recently stepped into the role of partnerships director, born and raised in uh, Mumbai, India and Japan educated uh, in this country for uh, graduate and postgraduate work uh, and currently uh, working. We're just so so pleased to have you here. Uh, probably a little bit of a, a, a wayside stop on your public health career. I know you're headed off even working on a PhD right now in public health, but glad to have you there for a little while. And let me also just say briefly, uh, Fair Vote Washington, we are a nonpartisan volunteer driven champion of electoral reforms like ranked choice voting that will empower voters and bring us a more representative democracy. Uh, so let's see, I think with that, we are ready. Oh, I was gonna, I do wanna just, I'll uh, quickly let you know that at the end of the hour, uh, I'll put this slide back up again, but David has kindly made available several uh, signed copies of his book we'll be talking about tonight. Uh, and this uh, is not a fundraiser. We're not, we're, everybody's welcome to come for, for free to the webinar tonight, but we uh, do, fueling our movement, movement with contributions is always appreciated and you can make a donation. And if you'd like to receive one of the signed copies, there are some instructions for how to do that. Okay. So with that in mind, Mohit, I think we'll take it back to you. And I think I'll stop the sheet screen sharing at this point. Perfect. Okay. Thanks so much for that kind introduction, Lisa. And with that, let's not waste any more time. And without further ado, get started with David. So in your latest book, David, you strike this very hopeful tone about the problems, the entrenched problems in our democracy, um, and how citizens have rallied to respond to any assaults on our democracy. So I, I know in reading it myself, one of my first chapters was the very first one, which very aptly is called Second Chances and Rights Restored. You talk about how 
No state in the country has a higher number of previously incarcerated citizens other than Florida. How Florida had offered a path for citizens to regain their voting rights, but how former governors have increased the waiting period from, to more than a decade, even after sentencing requirements have been met. Talk to us about this context and how citizens have responded to this kind of attack. Yes, it was a really, um amazing to spend time in Alabama and Florida in Louisiana and to watch these these battles. Um, thank you uh, first for, for, for doing this, for having me. Thanks to everybody watching. Um, I'm struck just in hearing your own biographies, um, how many people who are now working on electoral reform have spent time in nonprofits, have spent time trying to solve problems um, overseas and have come back here with an interest in, 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 in trying to reform structures right here at home. Um, and how often it's a public health background as well. Um, this is a public health problem, you know? I mean, our, fixing our democracy is a public health problem and it's going to take all of us to roll up our sleeves. Um, Florida is one of those states, um, and this is what, let me start here. Um, the fight for electoral reform is a long one, and it never stops. There is no single victory that brings an end to the battle over voting and participation and representation. Um, because the questions that were at stake in Florida really go back on the ballot in 2018 about um, uh, felon voting rights really go back to the days after the Civil War. Um, and the federal government as a condition of accepting the former Confederate states back into the Union required that they ratify the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments to the Constitution, which largely had to do about citizenship and voting. Um, and what many of these states did in response was they, they did that, but then they re rewrote their own state constitutions in ways that would make it harder um, for blacks there to register and cast ballots. Uh, so this is the beginning of Jim Crow laws, this is the beginning of black codes, this is the beginning of laws that um, you know, make it a felony to steal a couple of oranges. Uh, and as a result, you would then lose your voting rights forever, essentially. Um, you know, in Alabama, they called this moral turpitude. And they said, if you were convicted of a felony that involved moral turpitude, you would lose your voting rights. What was a crime of moral turpitude? Well, that was up to the, you know, local election officials to, to um, interpret. Um, and ordinarily, it meant either being poor or being black. Um, and and so these laws very much still in place in the 1970s and the 1980s as the drug wars rage and more citizens are caught up um, in, the, in, the, um, in the penal state and, and are incarcerated. Um, and it gets to the point in Florida um, in the earlier parts of this decade that you're looking at 1.7 million people um, who had had a felony conviction in Florida and who had lost their voting rights permanently as a result of this. You only had a handful of states at this point in time that um, uh, took voting rights away permanently as a result, and Florida was one of them. Um, you were looking at about 10% of the adult population, more than 20% of the African-American male population in Florida, a real significant number of people. Um, and this is you know, a quite unevenly enforced. Uh, there is a, uh, there was a process under governors of both parties for many years that just didn't work. It required uh, governors to essentially hear appeals of individuals and it was a long, long process. And, you know, under, under some administrations, the number of people getting their rights back would just be an absolute trickle. It would be a handful and it could take you 12, 14 years just to, to wait in line and get a hearing. Um, and once you're out of prison, once you have paid your 
your sentence, served your time, um, you're back in society. You ought to get that civic voice back. You're paying taxes, your kids are in school, you're still being represented by, you know, in the state house. You deserve that voice. Um, and I think it becomes such an important issue in Florida because it, it, it affects so many people. You know, it, in some states, maybe not everybody knows someone who's been convicted of a felon, uh, but in Florida, the numbers are so large that once you're talking about 10% of the population, these are your neighbors. These are people who you may not even have been aware that they had something in their past uh, that they had done and served their time and gotten out and now, unlike you, didn't have a voice. Uh, so the movement that is built in Florida around second chances um, that wins a huge victory in 2018, uh, more than 64% of citizens in Florida got behind this. You know, it's a nonpartisan victory. These are Democrats, Republicans, independents, uh, all together. You don't win anything in this country anymore at 64%, unless if you've got everybody working together behind it. And I think what's so impressive about the victory there is the way that they pull together black and white, left and right, Democrats, Republicans, churchgoers, um, you know, uh, uh, Trump-loving de deplorables on, on bicycles, radical criminal justice er, er, reformers, and they were able to make a case to average regular Floridians that this was not partisan, this was about fairness and allowing everybody to participate equal in our democracy. And at a time when so many of these voting rights questions, the time when, you know, vote by mail, uh, is so important and we need to be able to talk about these issues in a nonpartisan way. The victory in Florida, 64%, I think ought to really encourage us and send really positive signs that to most Americans, these questions are still questions of basic fairness. David, uh I want to just jump in here, listening to you again. Your passion is so evident. Um, where did that come from? Can you talk just briefly in your own biography? I don't know that about you. Where, where do you attribute that, you, you know, this spark of, of, of dedication to do what you did? Because you spent a year, this was not an armchair book that you wrote, right? I mean, you were in Florida with those folks. You were in, again, the, in your book, um, Unrigged is amazing stories all over, not in Washington state, but many, many states in the, in the nation. And you were there uh, with activists. Um, where did you get that energy, that drive? Where, where do you think that came from? I was the editor of Salon for many years. Yeah. Um, and we were covering, you know, I, I was running our politics coverage and it just, seemed to me in 2013 that something new and unusual was happening in Washington in, in the House. And I couldn't understand it as somebody who, you know, um, had been a political science major and, had, mm -hmm. you know, covered these things for a long time. Mm -hmm. um, why suddenly there were 50 votes to repeal Obamacare when it was really, really clear that the president was not going to um, allow his signature accomplishment to be repealed. He could simply veto it. Um, so maybe they try twice, but 50 times, really. Um, I, I'd grown up in Connecticut and was kind of staggered um, after the massacre at Sandy Hook and didn't understand why we couldn't even have a conversation about gun control in this country, um, even when, you know, kindergartners and first graders were the ones dying. Um, and one day I simply asked a question that um, uh, I said, why didn't Democrats take back the House in 2012 when we reelected um, Obama and Democrats kept control of the US Senate? What happened in the House? Um, I was just curious. Um, I didn't realize that Democrats had, had won 1.4 million more votes than Republicans that year. Um, and I mean, of course, we don't elect much of anything via popular vote, right? And certainly not Congress by a national popular vote. Um, but I started looking at individual states, and uh, I'd, I'd gone to graduate school in North Carolina, and I was like, really, North Carolina is 10-3? I didn't understand that. 
Um, I looked at Pennsylvania and I said, that's 13.5, huh? Ohio is 12.4. Uh, so how did that happen? And I came across um, a website for something called the Redistricting Majority Project, REDMAP. Um, and, you know, again, I was the editor-in-chief of Salon. I was assigning stories every day to Joan Walsh and Steve Kornacki and, you know, this incredibly bright uh, team. Um, and, you know, having, you know, politics staff meetings and talking about all of this. And uh, REDMAP had never come up. I didn't know what REDMAP was. Um, and on this web page, Republicans were taking credit for winning back state legislative chambers in 2010 um, in these competitive swing states uh, as a specific uh, a strategy designed to take control of the redistricting process in 2011. And I kind of sat back and said, that's, that's diabolical genius. Um, uh, that's really what happened? Um, and I'm like, and if that's really what happened, why don't I know about this? Um, because at the time gerrymandering was talked about, it was a geography, right? It was the big sort. Um, it was, um, and kind of, I went into Salon and I said, you know, I think, I think it was, uh, I think something different happened with the redistricting in this last decade than has happened in other times. Uh, it just seems like the technology changed, the intent changed. Uh, this seems like it's worth writing about. And they all looked at me like I was crazy. They looked at me like I was, uh, you know, a flat earther. And they're like, Dave, it's the big sword. Everybody knows that. Um, and I'm like, I'm not so sure it's the big sword. Um, and I couldn't get anybody else interested in writing about it. So um, it turned into the book. Um, and when you write about redistricting and gerrymandering, it's really easy to get depressed. Um, and it, the book comes out in in 2016, and um, it it had a lovely life. Um, but then it, you know, the conversation gave way to the presidential election, and I thought, well, maybe we'll talk about the book again in 2020 after the next cycle. Um, and then we had kind of an unusual outcome, and people started looking for answers to these structural questions. Um, and I was like, hey, there's a book that kind of talks about you know some of them. Um, and I'd go out and I'd talk to activists and I realized um, I was sucking all of the air out of the room, um, uh, that I had a rain cloud over my head. And uh, I started looking for examples of citizens fighting back, uh, really first for my own sake, because I had to do something to cheer myself up, uh, but also so I could give some hope at the end of these talks and try to tell people that there were things that they could do um, and the more I looked, the more I found these amazing, inspiring movements. Um, you know, Katie Fahey in, in Michigan, doing Voters Not Politicians, Desmond Mead in Florida, um, people who were working outside the political structure in really, really interesting nonpartisan ways to build reform movements around these issues that politicians said were too wonky and too boring for anyone to care about they were finding ways to connect them to people's everyday lives, to, to policy choices, to folks feeling disconnected from their government, from the non-competitiveness of their elections, to non-responsiveness of politicians, to the lack of accountability, and they were doing something about it. And I said, you know, if there's, if there's these uh, two or three movements, there are more, and, you know, um, Unrigged is not an armchair book, but it was uh, the honor uh, of you know, a lifetime to get to go out and spend a year alongside all of these people riding across Idaho with you know, Reclaim, registering voters in Alabama um, you know, at bus stops, um, trying to find the uh, former felons that the state of Alabama would not register that individual groups were going door to door trying to find. Um, it was unbelievably inspiring to me to get to hang out with the people who turned off Twitter and turned off cable news and said, there's something I can do and I'm gonna go out and do it. Great. I hear you uh, talk about gerrymandering, um, David, and, and that's something that's always stuck out to me as well. It's one of those words that I feel has gained a lot of currency now in, in the public. Um, 
I love that chapter you, in which you talk about Pennsylvania's seventh district, the nation's most gerrymandered district, and the way you describe it as Donald Duck kicking, uh, kicking Goofy. So I know that you you sort of term that as you know voters living districts so cracked, stacked, and packed that they snake their way in and out of the margins. For folks who may not have heard the term before, could you briefly explain what sort of gerrymandering means and what are the incentives that create these districts that snake their way in and out of the margins? Sure. I mean, um, I mean, gerrymandering is the dark art and dark science of uh, drawing legislative districts that uh, favor your side and disadvantage the other side. Um, you can trace it back to the very beginning of our politics. Neither side has got a, um, um, a big store of virtue when it comes to this. Um, as long as we've had politicians, they've tried to draw themselves districts that give themselves unfair advantage. You can you can look at Patrick Henry trying to draw, you know, James Madison out of the very first Congress um, in Virginia. It, it gets its name in 1812 from a governor right here in Massachusetts, um, whose party draws these, um, you know, wild state Senate districts around Boston uh, that a political a cartoonist looks like a salamander. Uh, so it gets called the, the gerrymander after Elbridge Gerry, um, the hard G, soft G. Um, I can't explain that. That is that is lost to history, I think. Um, and, you know, politicians have taken advantage of this for years and years. You know, in, in California in the 1980s, there was a congressman named Phil Burton, a Democrat who would draw these districts that he called his, his contribution to modern art. Um, you know, so um, this has been with us for a long time. Um, what I argue in um, in Rat Eft, um, since we're among a polite company, um, is is that something changes in 2010 and 2011, and that it has to do with Red Map. And it's not that gerrymandering is new; uh, it's that the technology that's available to these map makers um, is so much more precise. That our partisanship is so hardened and easily predicted. Um, and that the, the computing uh, uh, a software is able to crunch so much uh, data that is available and, and there's more of that than ever and that the mapping software is just incredibly precise. Um, so I went out and talked to, you know, a lot of people who have been map makers for years over multiple cycles over the 80s and 90s, 2000, 2010s, and they would talk about how, you know, even in the 1990s or the 2000s, they were still using maps and markers. If they were using computers, they maybe had time to do three drafts of a map. Um, but, you know, oftentimes the memory that was required to run these programs would crash their computers. Maybe legislatures in these states would give them three or four weeks to work on the maps. But they do the best partisan jobs they could, but a map was never necessarily locking a decade of results into place. Um, and the technology changes, uh, the data changes. Uh, there's, there's so much of it and they can now just go up and down a street and do you know, 70, 75, 80 different versions of these maps getting more and more precise every time. Um, and it, it's not just me saying this. I mean, I found all their emails in which they talk about um, you know, raising the partisan performance index by, you know, 0.003 in these places. Uh, you know, uh, I found all their spreadsheets that, you know, show how a map progresses from version one to version 70. You can see it over time. Um, and, you know, I mean, gerrymandering is cheating. Gerrymandering, and, and I think Americans kind of fundamentally understand that and are and are opposed to it um, by cracking you know uh, uh, cracking and packing are the two main are the two main um, um, uh, tools of this um, so ideally if you are if you're a Democrat and you are controlling the map making process what you want to do is pack all the Republicans into as as few districts as you can that they win overwhelmingly and then you then so uh, that's packing, um, because if they win those districts 90-10, uh, it means that you are wasting those Republican votes 
uh, that then cannot be in those other districts. And then you can just kind of spread the rest of their votes out and crack the other votes amongst all the other districts. Um, and if it's the other way around, it's the, it's the same thing. Um, so if you look at North Carolina, for example, it's a 10-3 Republican state right now, because what the, the Re Republicans are able to do was to uh, pack the three Democrats in a 50-50 state into three districts that they always win with about 72 to 77 percent of the vote. And then you create the other 10 districts that Republicans win with a solid 56 to 61 percent of the vote. And they can look like they're competitive districts, but because of hardened partisanship and because of all of the data that's available on folks, they can make finer and finer lines that um, still give them really, really uh, almost dead certain results. And you talk about this in that uh, in the movie Slay the Dragon, David. Uh, I just want to take a moment to talk about that as well because we will be screening the film on May oh, twenty so six p.m. Uh, Pacific time, and that's sort of being co-hosted by Cindy Black and the League of Women Voters. So we're very excited if folks can attend. David, could you tell us a little bit about what you talk about in the film, Katie Fahey in Michigan, and what's going on there? Yeah, um, when you write a book about gerrymandering, you don't expect documentary filmmakers to call you up and say, "Hey, we'd like to buy the result." The uh, right to make a movie about this. You just say, yeah, sure, <laughs> that's going to happen. And then suddenly there it is on the big screen. Um, um, I think I've gained some weight during quarantine. So I look, I look younger and uh, my face is thinner in the movie. That's the real me, by the way. Um, I, did, I hadn't had all these sheet cakes um, that we are all eating under quarantine, or at least in this house. Um, but uh, it's a wonderful movie, uh, and even though I know the ending, um, it still sort of makes me uh, cry a whole bunch of different times. A movie about gerrymandering that actually makes you cry, it's amazing. Uh, but they, they tell the story first of, you know, the first half of the, of the film really um, is radeft, and it sort of walks through the story of what happened in 2010 through a lot of, of interviews. Um, and then they, they follow really closely the story in Michigan as Katie Fahey um, and Voters Not Politicians fight uh, for redistricting reform there. And then they also follow the story um, of the attorneys from Wisconsin uh, who had taken uh, Gill versus Whitford all the way to the uh, Supreme Court um, um, and had hoped that that would be the case that, um, you know, finally won, a, you know, a national federal court ruling uh, that at least put some limits on, on partisan gerrymandering. Um, that was not to be the case in, in, in that case, as we remember. Uh, but um, so, so there's, you know, some, uh, some victories and some frustration and, um, you know, it, it, I think it mirrors a lot of what we see in this movement, right? You, um, you win some and you lose some, but the important thing is to be involved in the, in the battles and to keep on, to keep on fighting. Well, Mogat, thanks for reminding us to be sure to mention that movie, May 28th, and thanks to Cindy Black, who I think is on this call, uh, Fixed Democracy First Executive Director, who is the one who brought the energy to uh, uh, get that screening, and we're looking forward to it. It's a great film, and folks, if you can't see it on the 28th with us, make sure you do. Uh, uh, Slay the Dragon is the name of the film. Um, David, I'm, I'm struck not only with the film, but also with your book and just speaking to you how just this this um, kind of contrast, these topics are difficult to to even get your mind around. You and I were talking right before we went live how it's almost like you can't make this stuff up. It's just, it's so extremely unfair. And um, it has obviously then engendered all of this activity around the country. And at the end of the day, the story, the film are incredibly uplifting. They're so motivating. They're so inspiring. I, I'm, I, let me, so gerrymandering, we could talk the whole night about that. But let me bring that back quickly before we leave the census. Of course, it's 2020, so redistricting is happening now. Let's bring that back briefly to Washington State. I know that we've got folks from all around the country on the call tonight, but we are Fair Vote Washington. And I'd like to at least acknowledge that here in Washington State, 
we don't have some of the more extreme gerrymandering uh, processes happening because uh, the uh, district lines are no longer drawn by our legislature. We have now a bipartisan process. But tell us a little about that and about how we might look forward to even improving our approach uh, in the future. Yes, um, you know, there's there are a lot of different kinds of independent commissions, and I'm glad that Washington doesn't allow the party in power to draw lines. You, um, you always have a better process when everybody has a place at the table. I see a, I see a cat entering the screen behind you. Oh, this is my cat, yes. <laughs> Louise, sorry, she's upstairs. Hi, Louise. Uh, her out of here. No, no worries. It's lovely. Um, um, you know, and what the study sh on this show, you know, the studies show you always end up with a fairer process when you have representatives of both of both political parties in the room. Um, you end up with you know an even fairer process if you can, you know, not have the political parties in charge of the process, um, or if there are, you know, um, a real criteria involved that actually force fairness um, and nonpartisanship. Um, but um, I'm sorry, I, I got distracted by the cat and I lost Hi, Louise. The, the train of my question. <laughs> it's not Louise's fault, it is my fault. Um, um, what I would, you know, Washington and New Jersey have processes in which you essentially have the two parties make up most of the commission. So they're, they're not nonpartisan commissions, they're more bipartisan commissions. Um, and I mean, Walter Olson uh, at the Cato Institute and I like to call this buddy mandarin, uh, you know, in which, in which both parties kind of get together and they, they draw themselves, they cut a deal. And they, you know, they, they give themselves a fairly uncompetitive districts um, and the incumbents win most of the time. And maybe there's one competitive seat. I believe that's pretty much the case in Washington, right? The Democrats and Republicans kind of divide them up and there's, you know, one competitive seat. Yep. Um, and sometimes geography does play a role in that. And other times it's incumbency and partisanship that's essentially driving it. Um, and when that's the case, um, you know, citizens in all seven of those districts ought to have a real choice. You know, it's not, I don't think you necessarily get better government if um, you have one competitive district in a state and all of the rest uh, have been divided up between the two parties in a back room, um, you get you get a better process from a commission when you have something like California, um, which requires Democrats, Republicans, and Independents to be relatively equally represented on this commission. I think it's a five-five-four commission for Independents, um, and they have to travel the state, uh, and they have to listen in public hearings um, to. People talk about communities of interest um, and what towns ought to be held together. Um, and then they have to, um, you know, draw all of their lines completely in public. You've got real transparency. Nothing's happening in a back room. Um, and they have to come to an agreement. You have to have a supermajority of Democrats, Republicans, and independents agree together on a map. And I think that's such a lovely metaphor for sort of what we'd all like our politics to be. You know, you hand citizens a complicated problem involving representation and values and maps and districts, and you say, go out and gather the information and then do the best job you can coming to consensus on the best answer. Um, and if citizens can do that, you, you know, and you would think politicians could perhaps. Uh, instead, we have these decennial redistricting wars and um, you're going to have hundreds of millions of dollars spent on these state legislative races this year, essentially all with the efforts of controlling um, map making power in 2021. You just had a, a state, uh, um, it's getting to the point in which now all of these um, uh, state Supreme Courts are going to be key uh, battlegrounds in um, determining 
whether or not maps are are fair, uh, or if they are partisan gerrymanders, or in in casting tie-breaking votes, and so you are seeing, you know, both parties throw tens of millions of dollars into politicizing state supreme court races, and oftentimes the number one issue in those races is the redistricting. You just had an election in Wisconsin uh, that had to be held in person in the middle of a pandemic. Uh, and really the main reason that that election was going to be held in person in April uh, in the middle of a, a stay at home order was because there was a state Supreme Court um, election on the ballot that was crucial to the redistricting. Um, and both Democrats and Republicans were playing games uh, uh, there for, you know, for, I mean, Democrats thought they had an advantage with turnout in that election because it was being held on the same day as a contested political primary on their side. So they thought more Democrats would come out to vote. So they were really excited about that. Uh, and they probably waited too long to uh, uh, try to cancel it. And then at the last second, when the Democratic governor did try to cancel it, Republicans in the, in the legislatures uh, thought suddenly they had had the, the upper hand. Uh, when it came to turn out uh, and said no. And as a result, people have gotten sick. Um, yeah. You know, all of this has to do with redistricting. what we're gonna do with the redistricting. I mean, it's, it's, incredibly, it's incredibly important. Um, yeah. The maps that are drawn next year are going to be the playing field for the next decade in all of these states. Uh, it's absolutely crucial. Um, and what the Republicans realized in 2010 was that by winning control of 107 state legislative seats in those key 16 states that the red map focused on for less than $30 million, that was able to really turn our politics for a decade. Um, and, you know, um, Republicans figured it out first, but, you know, both sides are are fully woke now and um, it is, you know, I would say it's not how our politics ought to go. I think one thing that really stands out to me as you talk about these sort of complicated issues around redistricting and gerrymandering is that, you know, one natural question to me is, is there a better way? Is there a better way than sort of fighting for this every 10 years, looking at how district lines can be manipulated? How does something like ranked choice voting plug into this kind of conversation? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think that, that there are, are, are lots of better ways. You know, I mean, I think that the California commission model is, is, is certainly one of them. I think the Iowa commission model is one of them. What you've seen in these states that have, um, you know, worked in, in 2018 to, you know, take down gerrymandering is, you know, a lot of different approaches. Um, and, and that's good. I mean, redistricting is about values um, and states ought to make these decisions themselves. Um, I, I think the gold standard in all of this really is, um, you know, Don Byers' uh, Fair Representation Act that the Virginia Congressman has introduced now in the last uh, two Congresses, um, which um, would involve larger districts represented by more, um, more people. So essentially, you get rid of single district, um, a winner take all, and you replace it with, you know, larger multi-member districts and ranked choice voting. Um, and if you're able to do that, um, I think really what you do is you, you end the power of those district lines to dictate outcomes. Um, and you incentivize politicians to campaign and govern differently. Um, and you end up representing more people in a fairer way. Um, I mean, I'm talking from Massachusetts tonight. Um, and Massachusetts is a blue state, but it's a blue state that's had a Republican governor almost the last 25 years. There's been one Democratic governor here since Michael Dukakis. Um, so there are clearly Republicans and people who would like to be represented by Republicans in the state of Massachusetts. Uh, the state has a 9 0 a Democratic delegation in Washington. And the last time a Republican got elected from here was 1994, I believe. Um, so you got to go back, you know, at 25 years. Um, if, you if you had ranked choice voting instead of nine single 
if you used rank choice and multi-member, you would have say three districts of three instead of nine districts. Um, and if you used rank choice, you would see Democrats and Republicans elected out of Massachusetts. You might even see independents or you know, third parties that might be able to generate enough support to get a seat. Um, and then imagine what Congress looks like if there are Republicans from New England again, if there are Democrats from across the Midwest again, because there's just as many Democrats in, you know, Kansas and Oklahoma as there are Republicans in Massachusetts and Connecticut who just don't have any representation right now and who don't have any real chance of getting it. Um, so I think you would have, if you could move to something like the Fair Representation Act, and I know it seems like a, a big lift, but this is a moment in which we're talking about big lifts. You know, we're thinking all of this through again as we try to make a democracy work. Um, you know, it's a public health problem. It's, you know, it's a structural problem. How do we put the pieces together in a way that, you know, generates a real outcome? And what we have now is a process that is giving us a dysfunction and gridlock, and it is representing extremes on both sides. We have non-competitive districts in which the only election that really matters is a party primary, which is a low turnout summer race that the bases come out. And politicians know this, so all they do is uh, you know, govern in such a way as to avoid a challenge from the left or the right we can fix this, but we have to think about, you know, what the real problems in our politics are. Um, and then how do we fix the polarization and the gridlock um, and single member winner take all, I think is a big piece of why we have this kind of polarization and gridlock. That's great. David, before we um, turn to audience questions, I did, um, want to just ask you about one more topic that you address in your book, and that's um, de voter disenfranchisement, particularly for Native American communities. Um, you tell the story of uh, 2018 shenanigans in North Dakota, uh, which as I was, you know, it just seems hard to imagine uh, the things that happened there. I wonder if you could tell a little bit about that and then um, you know, for us here in Washington State, we recently had a Native American Voting Rights Act signed uh, about a year ago that uh, my sense was really directly, directly attributable to having seen the, that horrific situation in North Dakota and wanting to make sure that um, we didn't go down that road. Uh, but I'm sure, I know there's more that we could and should be doing. But tell us a little bit about uh, the situation with um, Native American disenfranchisement. We talked about felon disenfranchisement in Florida and so on. The story <laughs> in North Dakota to me is just an amazing one. Um, and I think it starts, I think it starts really in, in 2012 in which you have a really close US Senate race in North Dakota. Um, in which the Democrat Heidi Heitkamp wins in an upset by a couple thousand votes. And her victory was attributed by a lot of observers to her support in the Native American community there. And Native Americans are the largest minority in North Dakota. Um, and what happened in 2013 was you started seeing these voter ID bills emerge in North Dakota's legislature. And a lot of people thought this was strange because the Pew Center, you know, and all of these folks who, you know, judge election stewardship and administration had, had given North Dakota the top honors in the country, um, you know, many election cycles in a row for the way that they ran their elections. Um, you don't even have to register to vote in North Dakota. Um, you know, it, it's, and the elections are still administered that perfectly. Um, and suddenly they were starting all of these voter ID provisions. Um, and what do you mean if you don't have to register to vote? If people, if you assume that everybody in North Dakota with that precinct has known you since kindergarten, which, you know, is, is, is one of the assumptions, um, why do you need a voter ID? Um, well, you could begin to answer those questions by, you know, 
And also if your elections are being run so well that you are winning national awards, you probably don't have a fraud problem or a security problem. There probably isn't a problem here to take on. Um, so people started to wonder, well, maybe this is a smokescreen for you know, something else. Um, and what they, they wanted to require in North Dakota was a street address on, on an ID. Uh, and Native American communities immediately said, well, wait a second, the, the one thing we don't have is a street address on our ID. Why are you requiring the one thing we don't have? And I'm afraid the answer to that question sort of answers itself. Um, this was a sophisticated yet blunt form of, of voter suppression. Um, and the courts kept pushing back and saying, no, you can't do this. There aren't enough fail-safe protections here. And the legislature kept sending back the same thing. Uh, you know, finally in the, in the fall of 2018, they got a court, a federal court t t to approve it and to, and to say it was fine. Uh, and so what you saw was this incredible push in the last six weeks maybe even fewer than that, um, before the election in 2018 um, of Native Americans um, working to, um, with universities and experts to make IDs that had street addresses on them. So they were doing this sophisticated geomapping, trying to you know, overlay coordinates to addresses on maps and then print up the IDs and put them in people's hands. Um, and it went on for weeks. They burned out ID making machines. Um, and what you saw in 2018 was that turnout goes up through the roof in all of these, um, in all of the, these tribal lands across North Dakota. Um, um, and I mean, I ought to, I, I ought to add quickly, it's really hard to, to get a driver's license in North Dakota. The closest driver's license to most of this tribal land is up in Rolla, North Dakota, which is about as far north as you can go without being in, in Canada. And that office is open about three hours and 45 minutes a month. It's open on one specific day in two small chunks with a lunch break. Um, so if you are, if you are, you know, at Turtle Rock or on one of the, um, um, of the, you know, many um, uh, tribal lands up there, you would have to, to drive hours on that one day and get there in that at one period of time. Uh, but to me, one of the really inspiring results of 2018 uh, is the first, all of this effort, second, all of this turnout, and third, um, you saw elected in 2018 a woman named Ruth Buffalo, the first Native American woman elected to, to uh, North Dakota State Legislature, and she defeats the man who proposed the original voter ID bill back in 2013, wow. which is just such a sweet ending to the story. Yeah. I couldn't have made it up. I love that about your book. It strikes, you know, even though it discusses such entrenched problems, it talks about these hopeful reforms, the ways in which people have built coalitions to tackle some of these problems. I, actually, that relates perfectly to some of the questions we have queued up from the audience. I do want to create some space for that, uh, since I know a lot of people have turned out today to, to speak to you. Uh, so Jeff asks, what kind of reform movements um, have you seen stick out that have gained traction? What kind of sort of potential movements to bring reform? Um, I think the ones that have built real reform are the ones that have, have, have found ways to frame issues around the sort of, that break free of, of right, left, Democrats, Republicans, red, blue. Um, and that is what holds all of these things uh, uh, together. Um, you don't win campaign finance reform and redistricting reform in Missouri with 62% uh, of the vote unless if you're bringing everybody along with you 
you don't win felon reenfranchisement in Florida at 64% in a year in which Ron DeSantis is elected governor and Rick Scott a U.S. senator unless if you are talking to everybody and framing these issues um, in the right way as questions of, you know, elemental, you know, fairness in a democracy. Um, I mean, ranked choice voting in Maine, um, you know, it doesn't win as, as a partisan issue, um, you know, one side or the other. It wins because it's citizens coming together and saying majority rule is really important to us. How do we find a way to get to a majority rule and also have this you know, culture of independent candidates that, that we value, that we want choices, but we also want to be governed by somebody that the most uh, people want as their leader. Um, you know, in, in Idaho, I drove around with Reclaim Idaho um, as, they, as they won Medicaid expansion um, in a, a red, red state, right? Um, you can't do that um, at, you know, again, more than 61% of the vote, um, unless you're talking to absolutely everybody. Um, and we were in, we were in Idaho Falls. We were in the, you know, far eastern corner of the state one day in August, um, knocking on doors. Um, you know, it's a very Mormon town. Um, and we walked up one driveway and there's a bumper sticker on the car. I'll never forget this. And the bumper sticker on the car says, Vietnam, we were winning when I left. And I'm like, uh, guys, why don't we go knock on the door over here? Um, you know, when this guy left Vietnam, we were ahead and I'm not so sure he's going to want to talk to us about Obamacare. Uh, and they're like, no, we, we knock on the doors. Uh, and they strode up and they knocked on the door and, uh, you know, the, the man comes to the door and he says, yes, I fell into this, you know, into this, into this donut. Um, my family falls into this position. I'm, 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 I signed your p petition. I'm going to vote for this. Uh, and I walked away thinking, boy, we think politics so polarized maybe our politics is just stuck in this false polarization. And if we can get out there and, and talk to one another and have, have structures that, you know, make sense, um, we can fix some of this. And, you know, electoral systems and structures are at the heart of it. And people get it at a gut level when you go out and talk to them. I hope that helps. It is. Do you want to take the next one? Yeah, go for it, Lisa. Um, okay, so Caroline asks, thank you for sharing your thoughts with us. I'm amazed by the 10% statistic in Florida. In other words, one out of 10 people has been to jail, and the chances are that in Florida, you may know someone who's been incarcerated. Question, the, the support for voting for ex-felons was based on fairness or knowing someone who was formerly incarcerated, is that it, or both? Either way, this argues for coalition building finding common interest and connection between people in real life to take the time to know people, to understand why democracy is important, avoiding social media. Yeah, I think That's there's a lot of truth there. Um, I'd say this, you know, I think, that, I think that sometimes what you see among Democrats or on the left is you would immediately, uh, I think that there were a lot of people who wanted to make this a question of racial equity and fairness in Florida. Uh, and in some ways, it was an issue of racial equity. All of this goes back to, you know, the uh, Jim Crow laws passed after the Civil War. Um, but what they realized very quickly was that if they turn this into a question of race, if they turn this into red versus blue, that they would lose. Um, in Florida, you have to have 60% if you want to uh, pass a ballot amendment. Um, you're not going to get the 60% of the vote if you uh, uh, frame this in, in polarizing partisan terms. Um, and so they stayed so far away from that. Uh, they built their messaging around, around equity, around second chances, around the eligibility to win back your right to vote. 
um, which I think is the right thing to do. Um, this didn't just affect Democrats. It, it's not as if all, all 1.4 million people who got their, their rights back um, were all going to vote a one way. It's not a question of partisanship. This is a question that once you've served your time and you've, you've gotten back to the community and you're, you're paying taxes, uh, you, you deserve to have your, your voice back. Um, and they framed it that way. Um, and they won with 64%. And I think that there's a lesson there for people who want to see electoral structural change made. Um, it's a loser if you frame it in partisan terms. It wins if you can appeal to the kinds of American values of, 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 of fairness and representation. Thanks, David. I know Kit has a question. Kit is actually one of our earliest supporters at Fairboat Washington. She, I know, has uh, sort of been campaigning a lot around this, talking to a lot of people about why ranked choice voting is a better way to vote. Her question actually rela relates to gerrymandering. She says, I'm curious how you found the emails that detailed the nefarious gerrymandering. How did you manage to sleuth or investigate that? Whew, um, that's a good question. Um, uh, there had been a lot of litigation around some of this, so I was able to kind of mine through a lot of the of the court files. Um, there's, you know, tens of thousands of pages in all of these court files, and, you know, our, our old apartment was filled with boxes and boxes of them, and um, we were able to find a lot of them in there. Um, you could, you could file public records requests in some states. In some states, um, uh, I mean, technically this is a state process, so a lot of this had to be done on official email accounts. So in some states I was able to file public record requests um, and get a hold of some of these uh, documents in that way. Um, in other states, there were, uh, in Ohio, for example, the uh, League of Women Voters had already done the public records request and I was able to kind of piggyback on, on their efforts. Um, and, you know, um, there were some people who were involved who perhaps, um, leaked me things, uh, whose names I will, <laughs> I will keep quiet. Um, but, uh, as you ask questions, uh, and, um, kind of figure out a process, it's, um, uh, it's amazing what comes out of the woodwork. <laughs> Great. David Becky asks, well, first begins with thanking you for your work and your hard work and your heart. And um, she says, as a diehard RCV fan, isn't there a dicey aspect of saying that ranked choice voting is a way for majority rule? It's a layered thing. Can you give us a way to think about that? And again, yeah. thanks for your work. Yeah, no, I, I think, I think, um, I think it's not necessarily a question of majority rule so I should be careful as I, as I, um, I, I think it's about choice and voice and being certain that everybody feels as if their vote matters um, and that they don't feel forced into a binary choice um, and if you look at Maine, for example, where, you know, so much of this kind of took off nationally, they had a long history of three, four, five candidate races for governor. Um, and this was, you know, part of what they cherished about their politics. They loved having independent parties involved. Um, they thought it created, you know, more choices and, and, and a better system, a better campaign. The problem is you begin to have plurality winners at 35, 36% of the vote that a major that, you know, oftentimes, you know, two thirds of people, you know, voted against. So then your wonderful five way elections full of choice become finger pointing about spoilers uh, or you're wasting your vote or by casting the vote for the person who you really want, who's maybe in fourth place, you're actually helping elect the person who you want least. And you turn everybody into a pundit and a poll watcher. And um, it's, 
what if we had a system that gave you the best of both worlds, that gave you the ability to have all of the choice you wanted, but still produced the winner that the most people could get behind. And to me, that's the value of single member RCV. Um, you are able to protect choice and also fairness. Thanks, David. I want to stick to ranked choice voting for a second here. I know we mentioned Yakima briefly in the discussion. Um, just for our, our listeners, our attendees today, um, you know, what's going on in Yakima right now, it's a county that's incredibly diverse. It has a 48% Latinx population. Um, and even though it has such a diverse population, it has only ever elected one Latinx commissioner to the three county commission. Um, David, can you walk through maybe why something like this might be happening? How ranked choice voting could be a remedy for an issue like this in terms of representation? Yeah, absolutely. Um, and um, I'm sure you know far more of the ins and outs of Yakima than I do. Um, but I mean, I followed it a little bit at a, at a distance. I haven't been as actively involved as you, so I don't want to um, I don't want to take that over. Um, but you know, electoral rules matter. And the rules are often designed in ways um, for groups to stay in control um, and to hold on to power. Um, and that is often what the effect of, um, you know, at, at large, you know, districts can do. Um, if you are uh, electing at large, it is a way for 52% of the population to have 100% of the seats, right? You can, you can be 48% of the public um, and end up with zero time and again and again. Um, and that's not fair. Um, so, you know, and if you're doing districting, it's the same thing. You could then gerrymander those seats in such a way, oftentimes, that you have three 52, 48 districts that always give you the exact same outcome. Uh, so if you are able to do ranked choice voting, it gets you closer towards proportionality. It gets you closer towards fairness. It allows everybody to be represented. It means you have better elections and fairer, more honest representation. David, you, I hadn't realized, live in Massachusetts. And um, I've certainly been having my eye on what's been happening in Massachusetts. You talked about having been out uh, in uh, Idaho Falls and knocking on doors and talking to people. And of course, the activists in uh, Massachusetts who have been working so hard to line up the, the support for ranked choice voting got right to the moment and all they needed was another, what, 14, 10,000 uh, signatures this summer and then crash the lockdown and the fight with the Secretary of State recently in Massachusetts uh, agreeing that they can now go ahead and collect those signatures electronically. So if they can get across the finish line, then we're due to see a, a ballot initiative on the November ballot for statewide ranked choice voting in Massachusetts, correct? Bring That's us right. up to date with that. What do you see happening? That's right. Um, uh, I, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's hard to say what's going to happen here. Um, I mean, there's a really active and energized campaign, but things have really come to a, a standstill in politics. Um, I mean, I get text messages from them every day, um, you know, trying to um, you know, gather more signatures online. So there's a really active and, and energized effort. Uh, I think they'll be able to get across the finish line. Um, and then you've got to make your case to the voters here. Um, you know, it has, it passed in Maine. Um, there are a lot of communities in Massachusetts. Um, I live out in the western part of the state, um, you know, where I mean, East Hampton has adopted ranked choice voting, Amherst in some of its elections, um, you know, Northampton is talking about it. Uh, so there's a, you know, a lot of towns here that are using it. Um, it's become, I think, a, a fairly widely known and accepted and popular and you, um, so 
uh, but there's you, there's a power structure in in Boston, um, you know, a one party power structure. Um, so we it will be interesting to see um, what happens um, and what kind of opposition emerges as this heads toward the uh, the ballot. Um, I'm hopeful and optimistic, um, and uh, there's a lot of really passionate activists on the ground here working to make this happen who are, are doing amazing work. I have another question. Sure. <laughs> David, I'm struck by how quickly uh, you and sometimes your colleague Rob Ritchie are able to get uh, something in the press when something happens that's very timely. Yeah, you're right on the ball. What are, I wonder, what are you watching now? What are some of the particular movements and, and developments that you've got your eye on? Um, I think we all should be watching Justin Amash and how, how a, a libertarian campaign for the presidency will be covered and what opportunities there are for ranked choice voting but coming out of, of this. Um, I think there's a real opportunity here to make a case that um, RCV allows for people to vote for an independent if they want to, but it also protects you from a plurality winner taking every single electoral vote from, from these states. Um, and there's an opportunity here for Republicans and Democrats, I think, to um, be woken up to uh, the importance and, and how RCV is better. Um, I think that as we think about voting during a pandemic and we look at the states that have had disasters uh, where they've been in court the day before trying to press the pause button on elections in Wisconsin and Ohio, if you look at all of the primaries around the country that have been canceled, uh, well, uh, postponed, um, um, but who knows if they will, will happen in June. Uh, that it's also really important to look at the places that have been able to continue. Um, and let's learn some lessons from the states where they've been able to continue with voting. Um, in Kansas, in Alaska, Wyoming, Hawaii, what did they do? These are states that uh, adopted vote by mail plus ranked choice ballots. Um, and they've been able, as a result, they weren't doing this in, because they predicted a pandemic. But by making these choices, they effectively pandemic proofed their elections anyway, and they've been able to continue with democracy um, even in the middle of a big crisis like this. Um, and I think that, that that's a really important thing for us to be thinking about. Um, that it's not just voting by mail. Um, can you imagine if, if this had struck two weeks earlier and the Democratic Party still did not have any consensus behind a nominee. Um, if this was still around Super Tuesday, if, 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 um, if the pandemic shutdown began on March 2nd instead of on March 14, um, all of these postponed primaries would look very different. Um, but the states that had ranked choice ballots and vote by mail would have been able to continue. Um, and so I think as we, as we think about how we conduct democracy in a pandemic, I think it's really important to look at the, the success stories from this spring. Um, and then we've got to be looking at, you know, at what do we do for a presidential election and all of the important 2020 elections? in the fall. Um, how do we make sure that people aren't being forced to choose between their life and their, and their vote? Um, and, you know, vote by mail is an important piece of this, but it can't be the only piece of this. We have to be, you know, working really hard to be certain that um, there are, you know, that, that there are multiple options for everybody um, because there's no one size fits all solution. I know that Fair Vote has had this uh, wasted vote tracker from the presidential primaries, and I know that Washington State got a starring role as one of the highest numbers of wasted votes because we've got one half of the equation. We've got the vote by mail, which was great, but we didn't have the right choice voting. So we had so many candidates drop out just in the day or so before our election date that 
uh, more than 25% of uh, the voters in our state wasted their vote on candidates. I should, have mentioned, I should have mentioned that piece of it. I mean, that's the other thing that a ranked choice ballot does. If we're going to move to this amount of mail-in voting, um, and ballots are being sent in, you know, weeks ahead of a convention. I mean, I mean, this year you had what, Buttigieg and Klobuchar drop out two days? Warren. Before uh, the election, um, be, yeah. before the, um, two days before Super Tuesday, was it? That, that, that Sunday they- I they think it was just before out? our March, t Mohit, you know this, right? The, the deadline for when the we, so who was dropping out we had we had yeah. uh, it was just before yeah, our mar just we, before we were march 10th we were march okay. 10th and so it was just it was before about that 10 days earlier every, everyone yeah. had, had yeah. gotten out and if you'd already mailed in your ballot you were in trouble but if you and could if you could I, have run, you know it's not your fault that you know Buttigieg and Klobuchar or Bloomberg or whoever it was you know got out of the race right. um it, Voting by mail is is a wonderful thing. It's better if you can vote by mail on a ranked choice ballot. Yeah. Okay. David, we do have another question from the audience. I love this one from a partnership standpoint, because again, it talks about coalition building, but um, it's, it goes like this. It asks, uh, how can systemic reform movements like ranked choice voting, anti-gerrymandering and voter re-enfranchisement organizations be better at forming coalitions and supporting one another? So this could be, you know, nationally, but also as we look to doing that in Washington, what can we learn from other states? How do we sort of build a movement? Yeah, it's a good question. Um, you know, I think the, I think you're seeing a lot of real coming together right now over these questions as we head towards the fall. You know, it, it seems to me like there's a really strong coalition of organizations that are working on all of these questions around safeguarding elections in the middle of a pandemic and expanding mail voting and you know, being certain that um, you have a lot of options to be able to vote safely and securely. Um, I, I take a lot of heart in that. And I take a lot of heart in seeing that there's um, um, the more conservative groups in the, in the mix here as well. You know, it's not, it's not simply, um, you know, left-leaning good government groups that are doing this. You see, you know, Bill Crystal's group um, uh, talking about this a lot. I mean, Evan McMullen, Stand Up Republic. Um, that's what's really going to matter uh, is whether we can build coalitions um, across all of these reforms, but also I think coalitions across the political spectrum uh, that as we get closer to an election and partisanship heightens that much more and perhaps there's you know presidential tweets that say this is you know voter fraud and you know vote by mail is is a is a, a trick designed to elect you know one party or the other um, that there's a lot of voices uh, standing up and saying no actually this is nonpartisan this is about democracy this is this is yeah, this is good. <laughs> David, I have a question bringing us back to Washington again. We're uh, one of, I think, just two top two states, right? I think Washington and California. Um, and I'm wondering, uh, for, for it's, it's evident in Maine that folks were motivated after having nine of their last 11 governors elected with less than a majority of the vote, where they saw vote splitting from independent candidates who came in and split votes off and so on. So they, the main folks got it. They, they really understood. Um, here in Washington, it's harder for people to see the pernicious effects of vote splitting and the spoiler effect and so on, because whenever we come to our general election, there's only just two people in the race. And so we always have a majority winner. Um, there are some things we don't have, like choices on the ballot and so on. <laughs> um, can you just uh, talk to us a little bit about what you would see, some of the um, important messaging uh, uh, approaches in a top two state to talk about the benefits of ranked choice voting? Um, there's, there's two new studies that just came out uh, this week that I kind of need to uh, digest, one by Eric McGee, um, who uh, was famously derided by Justice Alito as the young researcher who came up with the efficiency gap uh, in the Supreme Court case on gerrymandering. 
uh, the other by Christian Gross at USC, um, you know, both uh, terrific political scientists um, looking at, at top two in California. And I need to take a better look at those um, before I really talk about the, the effects there. Um, but you know what I would say is, you know, I think top two is, is terrific. Top four with RCV is better. <laughs> you know, then you get, then you get real choice, uh, but you also get that same result of avoiding a plurality winner uh, and being certain that um, you always end up with a winner who, who the most people, you know, get behind. Um, and uh, I think it'll be really interesting to see how top two progresses, you know, um, you've seen some cases in which you've ended up with, you know, two Democrats or two Republicans. Um, and then um, it seems like oftentimes the politicians and the parties are trying to figure out ways to, you know, game the system and, um, or they're, you know, vote splitting in the, in the original primary. And you end up with that, you know, same kind of that crazy calculus of people looking at polls and everything else. And the polls aren't even, reliable these days. So if you're, if, you're, if you're looking at polls to determine your vote, that's kind of silly. Um, if we could to turn top two into, into top four plus RCV, um, if I could wave my, my magic wand, let's do that. Hey, you know what? You just invented our local options bill. That's what hey. our local options bill does. So that's, good that's for you. Perfect. Love it. We have, a, we have a question now from Cindy Black, Executive Director of Fixed Democracy First, who's uh, uh, sponsoring this filming uh, screening of um, uh, Slay the Dragon. Hi, Cindy. She writes, uh, how can we educate and engage younger voters as well as future voters to embrace ranked choice voting and single transferable vote? They're the future leaders and it's so important to get them to buy in. You know, I think the amazing thing about this is like so many uh, colleges right now are using RCV. Um, you know, student government elections are being conducted using RCV. Um, I think that um, this is only going to become more and more standard amongst amongst young people. Um, I think sometimes it's 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 us old folks uh, who have to have it kind of explained to us, uh, and it seems like maybe uh, you know the uh, first. Um, you know, when I was just learning about a lot of these new reforms as I was starting work on the first book, um, uh, you know, a lot of it seems like, oh, I hadn't thought of it that way, and how are we going to do that? Um, and then you realize, well, there's a lot of places that are doing this, and if we talk about how and why it's better, um, we can convince people. Um, and it's, it's, it's older folks, I think, those of us who've been doing it one way for a long time without necessarily thinking about why or whether it's the best way or whether it's the only way or what other countries have to offer in other, other cities. Um, and um, once you recognize that there are other structures and other systems, um, you can convince older people Younger people who are coming up in, uh, you know, voting in in high school and, and student council and, and college elections with RCV, I think they will get into the real world and wonder why they don't have it there. Um, and that is going to, I think, create real, the opportunity of real change. Um, it's once people get used to voting with more choice and more power they like it and they want to have it more often. I love that. David, what, where, where is ranked choice voting being used around the country? I know you mentioned Maine, which has it statewide. Um, what are some other jurisdictions that use ranked choice voting? And I'm very interested particularly in that multi-winner form with proportional representation. So could you tell us a little bit about the history in the United States with proportional representation as well? Yeah, there's, there's, um, you know, right now it's, uh, I believe it's about 12 to 15 cities around the country that are using RCV. Um, I mean, everywhere from, you know, Cambridge, Mass to uh, Portland, Oregon to, to San Francisco to Minneapolis and St. Paul and Oakland and 
um, I mean, Albuquerque, New Mexico. Um, so there's, there's, you know, an awful lot of cities who have had a tradition of, you know, multi-parties or, um, you know, a larger candidate field and have realized that this is, you know, a better way of creating consensus. Um, you know, a city like San Francisco, uh, where, you know, it's a one party city, right? Um, you know, it's a Democrat is always going to win there. Uh, so you are, RCV is a wonderful solution that creates um, a, a, the winner that the most people can get behind, um, as opposed to really pitting, you know, groups within a coalition against each other, um, because that's what happens um, in elections. Otherwise, they're, um, you know, I mean, there's, there's, um, um, you saw this in San Francisco in the last election, which you might have an African American candidate and a gay candidate and an Asian candidate, um, and the communities are rallying behind um, their favorite, and they're you know tearing the other sides down, and it's harder to kind of come together. When you use RCV, you see more collective campaigning. You see more people, you know, campaigning to, to be someone's second choice, um, and you always end up with that, you know, um, you know, I, um, I'm trying to stay away from the word majority again, <laughs> but um, you you come away with a real consensus winner um, as opposed to a plurality winner. Um, but I think you're also seeing it across, you know, Utah right now, you know, a number of towns and counties in Utah have been adopting it and they started because they also have, you know, a tradition of, you know, multiple candidates in a one party state and they're trying to avoid expensive county runoffs. Um, so RCV and in many of these places, it simply saves money. Um, it saves the, the local clerk from having to print up another round of ballots and pull everybody back out and have the cost and the expense of doing another election. Um, so it produces better results and it costs less. I mean, uh, the, there's, you know, winning messaging for, you know, left and right there. David, just a quick uh, clarification. I, I, I think you misspoke in uh, Santa Fe, New Mexico is the city in New Mexico that's using ranked choice voting. I used to live in Albuquerque and unfortunately Albuquerque passed up the chance to start using it recently, but maybe they'll get there. I thought before I said it and then I realized I <laughs> had okay. the wrong one. It's three hours later here. <laughs> yeah, you're good. No, that's great. Um, I wonder, David, we're going to, because we're looking forward to this uh, screening of uh, Slay the Dragon on May 28th. Everybody's invited. Um, could, and because the movie was, you know, made uh, some time ago, uh, tell us the sequel. What's happening there now? What's the, been the result of that amazing story that you tell in your book and that's in the, in the uh, movie? Um, it's actually happening. You know, I think that, I mean, Michigan won, you know, I mean, I'm not, it's not a spoiler alert. I think, right. I think everybody right. knows that. Yeah. Um, I think that in 2018, there were these tremendous victories for democracy reform around the country. Um, and what we have seen in the last year or so have been efforts by legislatures to roll back, um, sometimes even to gut uh, the heart of some of these re reforms. And to me, that is going to be the stuff of the, of the fight ahead. Um, Missouri this week, um, politicians are looking to roll back the Clean Missouri Amendment that created nonpartisan redistricting there, um, and also a, a series of campaign finance reforms. Um, you know, you saw in Florida the efforts that have been made to undermine and limit uh, felon reenfranchisement that will probably end up before the U.S. The Supreme Court in the next, you know, 12 to 15 months. Um, so to me, the takeaway here is, you know, once again, these fights don't end. They didn't end with the passage of the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments. They didn't end with the passage of the Voting Rights Act. 
if a single law, if a single election could change or fix this, some of those things it, it would have. These fights on behalf of voting rights and representation are as old as this country itself. They've been with us forever. They will be with us in some variety of forever. What is important is that we are all engaged and active and involved in them. Um, I mean, Dr. King talked about the long arc of the universe being long, but bending towards justice, right? Um, and what I think we all need to realize is that arc, that arc doesn't bend itself. Uh, it bends when all of us reach out, grab, hold, and pull. Um, and we have to pull it towards justice. Um, if not, there's folks who are, are, are pulling it in the other direction. Uh, and this is a struggle for the heart of what, it uh, of what it means to participate in a representative democracy. Um, and if you care about that, and I think all of us should, we've all got two hands, we need them on that arc. I think that's as good a, a closing as any to uh, to this session. I know folks probably have a lot more questions with uh, with David. I will say, if you do have more questions, you can always reach us at info at fairvotewa. That's wa dot org, um, and we can always get back to you with answers. David is very accessible, um, so I'm sure he'll be happy to get to your questions. I'm on uh, Twitter. Email me. I'm easy to find. Yeah, there and we go. I, I want to thank you, David, so much for all of this and also for helping us uh, do a little fundraising on the side. Uh, just reminding folks that we do have some signed copies available of David's book. Happy to mail them to you. Uh, if you'd go ahead and make a contribution, we'll get that right in the mail. Uh, there's some instructions on the screen. And um, uh, many thanks again, David, for your time tonight. Thanks so much, everybody. I, I really appreciate the questions, the conversation, and all of you joining. Thanks so much. Thanks, David. One last, uh, one last sort of informational point here for folks. We do have another webinar coming up on Thursday, uh, and I'd love to put the registration link there in the chat window. Uh, it's called Ranked Choice Voting, Diversity and Democracy and Fair Representation. We'll be talking to three different organizers from three different states, um, really former directors and organizers. Uh, that's Minnesota, you know, California, uh, and New Mexico. So I highly encourage you to attend. Um, and David, Lisa, thank you so much for being here tonight with us. Um, folks, have a wonderful evening. Get a good night's rest over there in Massachusetts there, David. <laughs> Thanks for staying up late for us. Pleasure. Thanks, everybody. Take care. Good night. Good night.